everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Santa Barbara Nutrients YouTube channel. We have a very special guest today, Jen Hernandez. So welcome, Jen. Um, we're extremely excited to have you here today. For those of you who don't know, Jen is a registered dietitian and board certified in renal nutrition. And prior to helping individuals with kidney disease, she has a lot of years of experience in long-term care facilities as well. After her years of experience in all stages of CKD, Jen founded Plant Powered Kidneys, and that was mainly focused to help more people across the world keep their kidney function. She sees clients privately, um, as well as hosts live events on social media, Facebook and Instagram, and then in the Plant Powered Kidneys course. So we will have the link to her website as well as her social media platforms below for those of you who want to take a look. Really encourage you um, all to kind of check that out. She has a lot of great information on there. And Jen today is going to be leading the discussion on phosphorus and kidney health. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, our first question today, Jen, is just what is phosphorus? So phosphorus is a mineral and it's actually really, really important to the body. We, our bodies need phosphorus. So it's housed in our bones. It's a really foundational structure for our bones and it's very important that we get enough. The thing is, is that most people get actually plenty of phosphorus, if not more phosphorus than they truly need. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's something that we need, but we don't need as much as we think that we do. And that's where a lot of people kind of find their struggles when it comes to phosphorus. Okay. Is there kind of, so when a lot of people, it sounds like have too much of that, is there a daily limit or a daily value that people should kind of, you know, keep an eye out on, um, specifically those with kidney disease? So for people who have kidney disease or kidney issues in general, we look at the phosphorus range to be around 800 to 1000, maybe a little bit above that milligrams per day. And it sounds like a lot. I know a lot of people from personal experience working with people with kidney disease, a lot of people strive for like a zero milligram goal, even with phosphorus. Um, that's just not going to happen because it's so abundant and it is found in so many variety of foods. It's impossible to avoid it entirely. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that we want to aim for keeping that 800 to a thousand milligrams per day. Um, and, and individuals might have a different guideline. If your healthcare provider is telling you something different to go for, you definitely want to follow that amount or that range they're, they're telling you to go for. Okay. Okay. And that probably varies too, just based on, um, stage as well too. Um, yeah, and so absolutely. You hear kind of the, you know, phosphates and phosphorus. Is there a difference between those two? Yeah. So with phosphorus, we're talking about that natural mineral that's found in the body and that's found in foods. Phosphates are more of the additives and it's a, it's a structure of the phosphorus. And so usually you'll find it attached to something else. So the phosphates are something that we often refer to as the things that you want to be careful with because mm -hmm. They are also very, very predominant in our food, in, in our grocery stores, restaurants, all different kinds of places, even in drinks, even in supplements. Um, it's all over the place. So phosphates are usually what we start talking about when we do educate limiting is to look at phosphates rather than just phosphorus. Okay. I see. So when kind of looking at the nutrition labels, right? So of processed foods, it sounds like there's a lot of phosphates in that. Um, and what are some hidden sources of, of phosphorus? Like, you know, where are, where's the primary source? Where are they mainly coming from? So the phosphates are primarily coming from packaged processed foods, which is not something that people need to avoid entirely, but it's really about making smart decisions of what kinds of foods you're choosing and taking home. So for example, uh, colas, especially like darker sodas, they are notorious for having phosphoric acid. And it's not phosphate. It doesn't, you don't read the nutrition label and see phosphate. It's, it's hidden in phosphoric acid. So when you're looking for phosphates, you're looking for um, you're looking for a term that just includes P-H-O-S. There's a lot, there's a lot of foods out there that have super long ingredient lists. So what I also recommend instead of combing through the whole thing is like starting from the bottom and working your way up to look for anything with P-H-O-S, whether you can pronounce it or not. If it has PHOS in it, that is a phosphate. That is a phosphate additive. So phosphoric acid, tricalcium phosphate, monocalcium phosphate, pyrophosphate, 
all different kinds of terms. And um, it, it's something that can be hidden really, really easily and sneakily into probably the bottom area of that ingredient list. Okay. So kind of looking out for those four letters, the, the P-H-O-S mm -hmm. is, is really where to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that can probably be in, you know, one of the top five ingredients or even the very last one. Now, based on, you know, where it is on the ingredient label, does that kind of identify how much is in there? So if it's on the last, does that mean there's less versus on the first five ingredients? Yes, the placement in the ingredient list does tell us how much uh, volume or quantity a certain ingredient is included in that food. So the number one ingredient is gonna be the first thing listed. So oftentimes, let's say juice, for example, or like a juice type beverage, you might actually see water as the first ingredient and then you see like grape juice concentrate or apple juice concentrate because they diluted this concentrate into the water. So the drink is actually primarily water and then it's the concentrate and then it's so on and so forth with the other ingredients. And you might see later kind of towards the bottom of the label, those things like the food coloring or preservatives, which is what phosphates serve as very often. Um, and you'll find those towards the end indicating that there's not as much of them compared to like that main ingredient of water, but it is still something to be really paying attention to and to practice and get into the habit of looking at labels and looking for that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's a good tip. Um, no matter where it's at, just making sure we're reading kind of every ingredient yes. in a product. Okay. So I guess we want to kind of tie this back to, um, you know, why is phosphorus important um, to consider for those who have kidney disease? So phosphorus is also, to make it really kind of complicated, also known as a silent killer. Chronic kidney disease is a, a silent killer as well. And phosphorus is really deadly within that silent killer of chronic kidney disease. The reason is, is because we don't typically see phosphorus issues or imbalances until very late in kidney disease. When I worked in dialysis, this was something that was really happening all the time because there is such a small amount of kidney function remaining that the body is relying on the dialysis machine to do the cleansing and to get rid of everything. But it's there's only so much we can do because no one's going to sit on a dialysis machine for 24 hours a day, which is what our kidneys are doing. So it's really, really important to, even in the earlier stages, because I recommend it to everybody, everybody who has kidney disease or a history of a family history of kidney disease, to start getting into the habit of just at least looking at the phosphorus and practicing mm -hmm. uh, to identify where you find those phosphates in your diet, because mm -hmm. it won't necessarily indicate higher levels in the labs even though you might experience symptoms of phosphorus abnormalities, which can be itchy skin, it can be red eyes, there can even be calcification, which is hardening of the arteries in our body. And that's not something that we're going to easily be able to find out or diagnose. And it's not usually looked into until that late, late time when they see high phosphorus over a chronic, a long chronic period of time. So I always encourage everybody, no matter what stage you're at, again, to look at phosphorus and practice and get used to um, essentially finding substitutions that don't have those phosphate additives so that it's not the slow build over time of this phosphorus accumulation in the body. Right, right. That's actually a really good tip because, you know, my follow-up question on that was if everyone with kidney disease needs to limit their phosphorus intake. So it's more of like a proactive step at this, um, you know, oh looking at yes. sure, you know, right? Because regardless with kidney disease, right, we're going to start having some electrolyte abnormalities and really honing in and kind of identifying those ahead of time to get, you know, like you said, it doesn't really show up on labs right away. And so making sure mm -hmm. we're kind of aware of that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, a quick story about a client who we worked before they were on dialysis and we really talked a lot about phosphorus and we talked about being really careful about these additives and they did a really, really good job of avoiding the processed food that had those phosphates in them. And when they ended up, they did have to go on dialysis for health reasons, which dialysis is not entirely unavoidable. Um, but the really good news is that their labs were so good. Everything looked so good and they felt better because of that. And then their healthcare team was 
better able to support them because their labs and everything was just kind of falling into place and doing a really good job rather than the opposite of going into dialysis, not really knowing what to do, knowing what to change, not making those changes, and then trying to manage a high phosphorus, which can be really, really hard to bring down. So that proactive, just like you said, Alexa, it, it's really, really helpful down the long run. And sometimes it's hard for us to kind of think about that. Mm -hmm. Um but it is just so powerful and important. Yeah, especially with, you know, making, you know, dietary modifications, um, kind of, you know, do you, are there specific tips maybe for an individual who's in, you know, stage one, stage two, and they're like, wow, I need to kind of start looking into this um, and maybe switching more from processed foods to whole foods. Um, are, do you kind of have some clients in the past that maybe you've taken on a, you know, a step process of how to maybe implement this and in, in weekly or something like that to help individuals who are interested in this? Absolutely. Um, for one, we have a lot of resources on our blog about phosphorus and looking for phosphorus additives. We even have an article about fast food and how to find it there. So there's some really cool like techie tricks that we have, um, which has to do with just opening up nutrition information from a, a restaurant, a website, whatever, and just doing the control F to search for phosphorus digitally by typing P-H-O-S in the search bar. And that can actually scan the website and look for anything that pops up to mention any kind of phosphorus. So if you open up, I remember looking at um, a fast food sandwich shop who will remain nameless. <laughs> and I opened up their big nutrition PDF folder, or their, their big file. And I did my control F on my uh, computer and I typed in PHOS and it just highlighted all the way down. I could find every single ingredient that the restaurant had that had phosphorus in it. So it was really good to be kind of identify what they, which ones had it, which ones didn't have it and eliminate it really quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that people can do at home that I always recommend is do kind of a pantry audit. And instead of going through everything all at once, my recommendation to my clients, we actually do a session just for a pantry review. We start with the things that they commonly grab. So when you're looking at your pantry, grab and check the things that you always have on hand, that you always keep around, that you're using every single week, and take a look at that label. See if that nutrition fact, if, if that ingredient list has PHOS in it. And as you go through kind of this, in this prioritizing of what you use most often down to the things where you're like, I don't, I think I've had this in my pantry for two years. I don't know if I'll ever open it. That it, it makes it feel more empowering because you're really tackling the biggest opportunity for change rather than feeling overwhelmed and going through the entire pantry or trying to go through and just feel like you're never going to get through it or whatever the case is by taking care of the things that you really use more, most often and you make swaps from those things, that can be a huge, huge change in your phosphorus levels or just in how your body is managing phosphorus in general. Mm -hmm. Wow. Those are great tips, actually. You know, it, it seems overwhelming <laughs> to make a change, right? And so I really like how you pointed that out. It's like, let's go to the pantry. Let's go to the fridge. What do I typically grab as a snack, right? Let's mm -hmm. start there. Maybe look up online. What's a substitute for this with less with less FOSS? That's, that's actually a great tip to get started because I think that takes maybe some of the anxiety away from it as well, too. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of feeling like you have to know everything, check mm -hmm. everything. I mean, you don't have to search every single restaurant. Just search the restaurant that you go to most frequently or search the search the things in your pantry that you grab the most often or that condiment mm -hmm. drawer in the fridge that you're always getting something out of every day. Like do the things that are most habitual for you, the things that are happening all the time. And that will make a really big difference. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And nowadays too, restaurants, I mean, they have all of the information posted online specifically for, you know, allergies and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think most of the time you can find any type of information and ingredient label online as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think, uh, you know, one of my last questions was you kind of hear this relationship, um, you know, inverse relationship, I guess, um, between phosphorus and calcium. Can you kind of explain that a little bit um, and why that happens, what that means? Yeah, this is one of the things that I talked a lot about, especially in dialysis, when I was explaining what was going on to my patients and why when their levels were kind of out of whack, what was going on. 
So as I mentioned, phosphorus is an essential mineral. It's something that our body needs, and it's a big component of our bones, or even our skin, our teeth, our hair, our nails. It It is really, really important. And if we think about something like our bones, for example, I think a lot of people, the first thing they think about is calcium. I mean, I don't know about you, Alexa, but growing up, I remember seeing commercials for like the calcium chews and like, make sure you get your, <laughs> make sure you drink your milk for strong bones. Like there's that association with calcium rich foods and bones, but phosphorus is also in there too. So the relationship when it comes to phosphorus and calcium is, it's a good and bad one. The reason I say bad in a hesitant kind of way is because when we talk about controlling our phosphorus, so let's say, for example, uh, somebody has higher phosphorus levels. Typically, if they're if they're not managed early on, they tend to trend higher and higher. When there's too much phosphorus in the blood and there's no place for the body to put it, to store it, like storing it in the bones, then that's when the excess creates problems. And phosphorus and calcium are like best friends. So wherever phosphorus goes, calcium wants to follow. So with this extra phosphorus in the blood, it can pull calcium from the bones and it makes our bones weaker. And that's why um, a lot of people who have poor phosphorus control, they can feel um, kind of arthritic symptoms. They can feel achy joints. They're even at higher risks of bone breaks and bone fractures. I've had some really, really scary situations happen um, with people on dialysis who had uncontrolled phosphorus for years that the body was literally breaking down. So we want to be careful with that phosphorus control because that means we're going to better support our calcium control. Because when they gets into the blood and we have this phosphorus in the blood and this calcium comes out and kind of floats along with it, it's creating this crystal in a sense, this hard material. And then this is floating through the body. It doesn't really have anywhere to go. So it starts to settle into our soft tissues. And that's where people can start to experience more of that itching sensation and that calcification I mentioned where the arteries get hard because all of these little phosphorus calcium crystals are building up in the body and they can create blockages. So they can cause heart attack, stroke, anything that's kind of clogging up from the lack of blood flow. Um, it can cause that calcification and harden the arteries. And our arteries, they're meant to expand and contract. They're meant to move to help control our blood pressure. But if they become literally rock solid, they can't control the blood pressure as much. So now we have high blood pressure issues to deal with. And then one of the worst things, and it breaks my heart, um, it breaks my heart to, to even like talk about it again, honestly, but these chronically high levels that are uncontrolled, and I'm talking about like the really bad, bad cases, um, they can harden around the kidneys and prevent kidney transplant because all of those arteries are, are hardened and they cannot get a kidney into the body. They cannot get a new kidney in there. So I, I remember it was like a horror story. It was one of my, it was my first dialysis clinic and learning about a patient who got called in for a transplant and woke up to find that they didn't have a new kidney because they couldn't physically attach it into the body because of the calcification of the arteries. And I mean, I can't even imagine that kind of emotional roller coaster to experience thinking that you're going to get a kidney transplant and then to wake up and realize that you didn't get it. Um, but that was one of the very first horror stories that I heard about somebody who, who had a long history of uncontrolled phosphorus. So that's why I really like to educate and promote taking care of it early on because years down the road, that's when those complications can come up. Wow. What a, what a great insight. Yeah. yeah that's, that's crazy. You know, having such a downward effect um, of, of just looking at FOSS and beginning and just trying to be proactive about that. Um, thank you for sharing that story. I mean, that's, I think speaks, uh, speaks really loudly to people because this just shows how important it is to keep track of your FOSS, um, you know, kidney disease and, you know, FOSS that's really, really right there together. They're a pair. You need to kind of keep track of that. And Jen just explained, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of downward effects from that of, of not taking a proactive approach. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, those are all the questions kind of we had. Um, Jen, is there anything else you want to say on behalf of phosphorus, kidney disease, um, plant-powered kidneys, or anything like that? I suppose I could touch just really quickly about the types of phosphorus. Um, 
we have a lot of information about this on plant powered kidneys, but um, there are two different types of phosphorus and one of them is worse than the other. So the, the one that we talked about, the phosphates, that is the worst one. And another term for that is inorganic phosphorus. And the one that's not so bad that can actually be more beneficial is the organic phosphorus. Not crazy about the terms because I feel like it makes people think of like organic foods or something and it's not necessarily the case. It, it kind of is. But um, those inorganic phosphorus, we can kind of associate with those additives like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Organic phosphorus is the phosphorus that is naturally found in the body. So like I mentioned, we have phosphorus. Animals have phosphorus, plants have phosphorus. It is a very, very important nutrient for life. Uh, one of my dialysis patients uh, was a agricultural specialist and talked to me so much about the phosphorus in soil and how it how it's utilized to create and grow food. And it was really cool. But it made me think of organic phosphorus. It's it comes naturally from the ground, from from earth into our food. And that kind is not nearly as detrimental or harmful to our bodies as the inorganic kind is. And the reason is, is because we don't have a certain enzyme. We, we are not capable of breaking down and digesting the organic phosphorus as much as we are the inorganic. The inorganic, our body is able to absorb at a much higher rate. So one of the common questions we get is like, what about nuts? Because nuts do have phosphorus in them. Well, nuts, as long as there's no additives, they do have phosphorus, but it won't be absorbed as high. So this gets a little bit into more of a complicated answer from that very beginning question of how much should somebody have a day? Right. Because if you're just looking at organic, it could be a little bit higher because only a fraction of what you're eating is actually absorbed into the body. So one of the first things we do, like I said, is we look at getting rid of those inorganic phosphorus mm -hmm. and very, very often the organic phosphorus, we don't always have to track because it's not absorbed as much. So the phosphorus from fruits and vegetables and grains especially is super low absorption, like underneath 50%. So if you were to find a whole grain, which does have phosphorus in it, and, it's, and it shows you how much phosphorus is on there, not even half of that amount will be absorbed. So we always recommend tracking and using food journals, but I'll say take it with a grain of salt, for lack of a better phrase, but don't assume that that exact amount is going to be the amount that your body actually takes in, that your body absorbs, and that your kidneys have to manage. It's only a fraction of that. If you're focusing on those inorganic phosphates, those additives, and getting rid of those, that is going to be so much more important compared to just cutting down on nuts or switching out whole wheat bread for white bread or something like that, because you're going to be sacrificing a lot of good nutrients if you make those kind of changes, which at the end of the day is not as helpful. Right, right. It's not what you want to do, right? So thank you mm -hmm. for identifying those, the inorganic versus the organic. Um, I think that helps people to also kind of, you know, realize that they can still have some of the foods that have phosphorus in it, right? And those are the ones that also have oh, yeah. beneficial vitamins and minerals in them. Um, and so mainly looking at those inorganic, um, which again, like Jen had mentioned, are in a lot of the processed foods and always looking out for those four letters of phos. Um, so thank you for going over that. I think that's important for people to know. Um, a lot of times you think of, you know, one vitamin or mineral and, and that's it, right? There's no other types mm -hmm. of uh, branching off per se. Um, and that, that mm -hmm. can mean a completely different thing. Great. Very great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, this has been very, very informative and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, you know, this is really, really great. And we're super happy to have you, um, on our, on our YouTube channel too. So thank you very much again. Um, and we hope that this has been very informative for everybody. Um, again, all the links will be posted below this video. So if you have a chance to check those out, I highly recommend that. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Alexa. It was great. Bye. Bye.